Music is love. Music stimulates the brain in the same way as we feel love for others. The human experience is that wonderful feeling of love when great music comes into our brains, enables us to feel the connection with others that also feel joy, feel love through the joy of listening and knowing that others feel the same way. Music brings us to a better place. And that's why we're here, and that's why we do this instead of something else. So good morning, and thank you all for coming. Today's talk is about helping conductors to do the right thing. I begin with the presumption that conductors are very smart, talented, and of very high integrity. They also share the joy of music and have chosen a life of music rather than many other fields of endeavor that, for the most part, are far more, far more lucrative. Part of the responsibility of conductors is to identify and program new music. To give emerging composers an opportunity to have their works heard and to bring these works to the attention of the public. But this is much easier said than done. Doing the right thing also means making choices. Which works are heard and which are not? And there are more nots than yeses means that conductors must also be discriminated, as the title of today's lecture, and to utilize both objective and subjective criteria in the decision-making process of selecting new works to introduce audiences. That's not easy either. Audiences, and this is no news to you, are dwindling along with the corresponding ticket sales, and precious rewards are significant. And one of the reasons for that is the music itself. Let's face it, much of the music, the new music, it's really not that good. New music has a bad rap, and oftentimes, more bad rap, pardon me, oftentimes for good reason. So today's talk will help, hopefully help, by providing tools for listening in a different way. You all know how to listen. But perhaps through the composer's lens, you can listen in a different way. Composers tools for discriminating conductors because you do have to discriminate, you have to make a choice. That can help you make better choices, support the best breed of emerging composers, generate greater interest from the public in attending classical music concerts and garner support from the management of symphony orchestras. <laughs> really doesn't like most contemporary classical music in this century, unfortunately, and the one that just passed as well. About 100 years ago, maybe a little more, many composers of contemporary music did much, a great deal that is, to successfully alienate audiences through, through the use of techniques that brought music further and further away from musical sounds that human beings are able to process and enjoy Largely self-indulgent, composers often wrote for themselves and their peers, insisting that listeners rise to their standards as they pursue atonality and other complex type techniques, many of which are beyond the scope of what we as humans can hear and appreciate. A friend of mine in New York says, I really don't want to go to a concert where somebody blows a trombone into a piano. This music often <laughs> involved complex systems and mathematical manipulations, the result of which was music that the brain could not decipher. Audiences reject the music of these composers and shun concerts in which these pieces were performed and still do today. This trend of elitist composers using systems became entrenched at universities and through tenure, it's a good and bad part of tenure, and contemporary music groups driving a further wedge between audiences and the creators and the works. It is only over the last 10 to 20 years or so that neuroscientists have begun to understand 
a human brain to our structure and enable to process information, including physical information. The field of neuroplasticity, you may have heard a book called uh, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. This field of neuroplasticity is a huge and complex area, and still in its infancy. But it begins to explain the distinctions between the hard wiring of the human brains, which are the universal genetic codes we start with, and from there, where brains are elastic. That's where the neuroplastic comes from. <coughs> Olivia Messiaen authored a treatise published in the 1940s called The Technique of My Musical Language. In the preface, he wrote, quote, the technique of my musical language is language from a triple point of view, rhythmic, melodic, and harmonic. This work is not a treatise on composition. Now the significance of this statement lies in the recognition of the distinction between musical language and compositional technique. These are not the same things. Since the beginning of the early part of the 20th century and until the present day, the line between language and technique for many composers and teachers at universities and conservatories throughout the world have become blurred and often indistinguishable. Makes your job hard. Today, musical scientists in Scandinavia, like Mark Braybrook, are digging deeply into the field of musical semiotics and helping us understand how and what we hear naturally, and what is learned through the rerouting and development of neural pathways on an individual basis, and then across large cultural expanses. In other words, what is genetically embedded? What's in your operating system of your brain, like the old series, if you know what that is? And what is learned culturally? the external influences that uh, affect the way we hear music and what we like, the subjective aspect. But it's not all subjective. The genetic code part is built in. So what we know so far is that the human brain is adapted from a neuroplastic perspective, but to a point. But no amount of artistic dialogue about expression and how the world will eventually catch up to an artist's chosen path of expression is a given. Sometimes the music just doesn't work. And no matter how many times we listen, it's not going to work. Leonard Bernstein had it right in the second and third board lectures at Harvard University in 1973, Bernstein draws upon the work of Noam Chomsky and speaks to the issue of universal grammar, formal universals that describe genetically inherited types of rules of the human mind regardless of language. Bernstein describes how we digest music from a genetic perspective regardless of language. He points out that there are some 4,000 languages in the world but our ability to apply genetic grammar is what is essential in his analogy to Chomsky's work in human linguistics. What does this mean? This, what this means to us from a musical perspective is that analogously the harmonic language selected by composers in their work has little to do with the application genetically embedded universal grammar, which is composition. This set of principles in the hands of able composers, combined with a choice of musical language, can result in digestible and enjoyable music regardless of the choice of language, or style, but almost. The musical language must also be digestible where the one-legged stool will certainly fall in. So let's take a look around academia, the books that are available, and see what's out there. 
If one excludes books and treatises on composition, where the focus of those books and treatises, we've seen many of them in school and we don't is on musical languages, which is the harmonic choices, like tonality, serialism, all, all the languages, jazz. These are, these are harmonic choices. So if you take all of those books out that are cold composition books and exclude those that are about harmony, and the composers who teach the next generation, there's not much left. Plenty of material on form. Sonatas, fugues, rondos, but what about musical syntax? Semiotics, the grammar, or the variance? It's very little. Good luck finding a book on this, and please let me know if you find one, because I've never seen it. Imagine that. If I'm right, composers in schools and universities are teaching composition, but there are no books on it. What are they teaching? They're not teaching technique, except on an individual basis. Some of these composers understand what composition technique and how it differs from language, theory, or all the things that I call elements of composition, but they're not technique. When you get into what technique really is, that's the mystery, right? The composers that do know what these are and are fortunate to learn this great art of the teacher that passed on this knowledge to them and can in turn pass this on to the next generation of composers. These are anecdotal methods of distribution of knowledge. One generation to another, like the stories of the family. Unfortunately, the, dis the disintegration of tonality and the substitution of a variety of questionable musical languages spawn several generations of composers without a foundation in composition and grammar. Language becomes a complete substance. It's wrong. And today, many composers are in too many instances short on composition technique and long on sound design. More on sound design. These nine items are not by any means a complete listing of what composition technique or techniques comprise them. But harmony, form, counterpoint, these are all elements. These are not techniques that are passed down successfully in order to teach the next generation of great composition is all about. I'm going to focus on some of these and a few examples, because you could be here for days on about examples from the literature of what works and what doesn't and to perhaps give you a different focus, a set of tools to look at, to utilize and draw from when looking at compositions in the rather unenviable position that you often find yourselves in, wanting to do the right thing. Bring new works in, find that next, next Stravinsky or Bretton Britain, and say, what am I dealing with here? And I don't want to turn everybody off and make my sales go to nothing, and get my boards and manners annoyed. So I'm going to go over what some of these are, and then a few musical examples. Controlled repetition. This is really the big one. Once, twice, and three times you're out. Controlled repetition is the art of repetition of notes, phrases, and other short musical gestures that were really developed by Haydn and Mozart. Controlled repetition, whether the use of lack of, or lack thereof, is the most frequent cause of a failed work in new music. This is often the make or break issue at the root of failure of new works and in any genre. This is where craft begins and ends, and where art and genius take over. I'll give you some examples of where the genius starts. Next is temporization. Those who enjoy working out, they say the ideal way to work out is six days a week and then you have a day of active rest. Take a long walk, don't work out. Work so hard, for example. So, temporization to me is like a roadside rest on a long journey. This is a musical and composition technique which provides listeners with a brief break, almost like active rest on a difficult workout, so that the music continues without interruption 
keeps going. It doesn't mean there's a rest. It's sort of like a pause when you keep the music keeps going. I'll show you some examples. But this allows the listener to be able to emotionally take in whatever they have heard before moving on to the next moment of music. I'll show you. Staggered melody. This is a big one also. I see this all the time. Most of the great works to take a look at. Well, melody, whether played or sung in any register, because you could have a crazy a total thing, whatever happened to all It doesn't have to be singable, but we recognize the tune as melody. The melody, in any of its forms, is invariably accompanied by one or more instruments or entire works. So, there are little ways of doing it, what I call staggered melody. You can have melody first, then the accompaniment, which comes in afterwards. You can have an accompaniment, and then the melody comes in, the singer, the oboe, whatever it is. Or all together, that's too deep. This technique applies to music of all styles and genres, from classical to the most contemporary of commercial and popular songs of the day. The compositional technique of staggered melody is the one most often omitted from composition schools at universities and conservatories throughout the world. A frequent deficiency of pop songwriters, composers of scores in the media, and throughout the remaining market. When recognized, or unrecognized, that is, to correct myself, the result is music that is lacking in an unidentifiable way until now. Particularly by those involved in music creation and or production to them through. I can't tell you how many compositions I've seen where all, all they had to do was put a rest in or have the singer or the soloist come in a beat later or the orchestra later, have some silence. Or if they had just done that instead of having everybody coming in together all the time, no matter how complex or the pedigree or credibility of those composers, all they had to do is stagger the melody. Keep it interesting. When you don't, it doesn't work. Everybody wants to, to leave. Let's talk about the next one. The sounds of silence. So when the music stops, the beat goes on, it's all about your heart. This is physiological. We have a heart. We all have a heart, except certain competitions. Which beats in pairs. So when you think the music is stopped, your beating heart takes over. The beating of our hearts is the part of the music, so for example, syncopation is a physiologically induced reaction. Now, the concept of stress and release in harmony, like dominant tonic, also applies to rhythm because of its physiological, our physiological way. It's applicable to the stress of music coming in on offbeats that are contrary to the regular beating of our hearts. And the resolution occurs when the music comes back in on a beat together or two beat, but in a rhythmic sense. It's physiologically based. And if it's physiologically based, it's genetically coded. It's up there. Where is sound? This is where Schoenberg and others like him lost their footing. Ever wonder why all humans hear music in much the same way? It's because music is in the brain. The overtone series is the structural foundation of Western music. It's hardwired, and the brain creates its own sounds that may not appear in the music score. Watch. I play these two notes. Same note in the middle. Uh, here we go. Our brain picks up the six four four. If you hear this, and you don't play the note in the middle. Because hardwired. So have all the serial music ideas that you want. As soon as you hear a note, we're going to create order. Think of it as the concept of anybody studied math and ran the theory. Remember when you were a kid, we had this game called Pick Up Sticks. Remember basically Pick Up Sticks? So if you take all these colored sticks and you throw them on the floor, if you have your eyes closed and you don't look at those sticks, they're random. As soon as you take your hands away from your eyes and you look at those pickup sticks, they're no longer random. In fact, they're ordered. You're thinking about how to pick up the stick without moving to all the others. Well, the ear, our brains absorb sound in the same way. 
This idea of equal tones is pure and unadulterated nonsense. As soon as you hear a tone, no matter, particularly on the low ones, your brain is going to pick up those sounds in the harmonic, the, the harmonic series go with those. But more on that later. Sound parallels. That's the real enemies of the language of the last hundred years that works. Wagner stretched tonality to the breaking point. It's nothing that we don't know. Already, composers went into two directions in the race to provide listeners something to hold on to and to prevent, to prevent drowning in a meaningless sea of sound. Some composers reached for organized pitch structure, like tonality and serialism. Obviously, I'm not a great fan of it. But others, like Hartog, created these little worlds. Remember me, for Cosmos? That became the foundation for new integrated and completely accessible language that only applied to a single musical work at a time. Remember when we played tag when we were kids? One of the kids would say, that tree is home base. Or the side of that building or that telephone is home base. So what has happened is there is a new concept over the last time which some of us call home. You could have a verticalization of certain melt of notes and, melt, and, and that sound, that cluster, becomes home base for that piece. That's more complicated than that. But if that is the substitution for what we the whole world to know as time. But it changes. Because home base we can play tag. One day it could be a telephone, it could be a tree, it could be a building. So home base is sort of like movable though. Now let's talk about blue. Blue is what keeps the piece from falling apart at the seams. The use of common tones to support chord changes in the music is essential for musical continuity. Music in any style, any style, that lacks at least one note that is common to the next chord, or at least too many, sequentially, is music that's going to fall apart. Be aware of this when you look at new works. If it's not holding together, maybe there's no glue. It doesn't matter the style. It can be quite disturbing to listeners, and they will be unable to verbalize why. But they will sense there's something wrong in the music that doesn't hang together. This principle of musical composition is essential to the enjoyment of music in any style, whether classical, film, commercial song, or any other thing. This is how we hear and enjoy. But you can notice that the glue is missing. You have ears and you're off, you have eyes. You can look at that score, something's wrong. Here's the next one, just the right next note. The principle of musical inevitability is the holy grail for composers. It is the ability to compose music that when heard by listeners and presses as a series of perfect choices. This is all about choices from beginning to end. From the initial idea to the final note, this is a wraparound technique for which each traditional composition technique constitutes the grammatical and syntactical tools for the language of music, then applied to improvisations in an organized way to the achievement of complete composition. That's what a composition is, refined improvisation. Great composers hear music and make choices based upon their best perception of the human experience and how we hear music. How do we hear music? vertically, a moment in time, linearly, moving forward, and contextually, retrospective, which is the current sound in relationship to what has been heard previously. That's an amazing unit of phenomenon. Think about that. One very way, easy way to determine if a new work is soundly composed and whether you should bother with it. is to think about whether the music could be edited and reordered in some way without making much of a difference. If that's the case, where it doesn't make a difference, I can take that, I can start that over there, I can move this here, move it there. If it doesn't make a difference, well then. Next, you're listening to a piece that's not worth performing. I'm going to turn everybody off. So much of the new music fails to achieve the goal of giving the listener the feeling the choices made by the composer at every moment were the best ones available, such that from beginning to the end, the path does not stumble. 
cause the listener to hear it off, become distracted, or turn it off. Last one, but that's a big one, by the way. First, I talked about that a lot. Sound design. This is the new composition technique of the 21st century. Sound design is quite an interesting concept. We have a new compositional technique. We didn't have that with Huffman Hyde when he really invented it in his last words, the composition technique is today. It really started sort of around the time of the you see with the concept of color, color in music. And then it really took off. Dave see, of course, a great composer, was a master of composition techniques, but he added elements of color and scenario to music, and then it's around the microbial and so on. This was picked up by composers for the next 100 years, whether in the early works of Bella Bartok, like Hubert, Pierce Castle, which was significantly influenced by David see it's all over, his uh, opera, Messiaen and his music, talk about color, even on a religious basis, Torval Takamitsu, and many others. But today, color, or in today's world of sound design, this has taken on a seat at the table of composition technique as an independent item. Today, composers now use technology in media composing the concert halls that create to effect. But here's the problem. When added to the mix of other musical elements and composition techniques, the results can be striking and very, very beautiful. But when sound design dwarfs other musical elements that are excessively diluted, or to the point of elimination, then what remains is sound that maintains, maintains the interest of listeners but for much shorter durations. It's just a little flesh. This can be effective for music cues, for anybody who's familiar with the music media industry, and short scenes or short little movements on a standalone basis. But when pieced together for longer works, it doesn't hold together. Be aware of this when reviewing new works with programming and the concept of nice sound and color, but does it work across does. Great. Other things I have to think about. So I've chosen some examples which are not necessarily from the classical literature. Here I'm going to, this is a, an example in, in Paul McCartney's song, My Valentine, probably the best one he wrote since the break of the Beatles. It illustrates the use of controlled repetition. What does it really mean? In general, there's all variations of this, you have an idea, a musical theme, a phrase, Notes, etc. Then it repeats almost verbatim or exactly. And then the genius of controlled repetition. So that repetition is that on the third time, there are mathematically so many places to go. Which one does that composer choose? Mozart did that for that.
get back to this more serious concept of the same. Cold it will count very
and it looked right. The production assistant looked at it, and they had all reviewed and everything. And then I got to the studio, live orchestra, and I was horrified because the chimes generate notes that are not in the score or on the mock-up playback. I had dissonances all over the place. They were not in the score. They were not in the mock-up. Remember, it's good to have mock-ups from your composers, but what happens when there are notes that are played live that are not in the mock-up because they don't come out of the score. This happens with film all the time. When you hear, you know, music that's created or sounds are created by sense, these synth pads, if you're familiar with it, that are in conflict because they're, you see just one note or one line on your track, and there are sounds that are being generated that you don't you know, see or hear. So let me just play an example because I have a piano, so I have to use it for something. Okay. So let's, let's look at this. You know this piece. Here's a piece that could have been written by Mr. Salier, and would have been perfect, just like this. <laughs> It's up for everyone to decide. 
But what did happen was the cross-fertilization through the Conductors Guild and an opportunity has arisen. So I'm blessed with the opportunity of working with Ruben in Venezuela. I'm just going to play this five-minute mock-up and uh, hope you'll enjoy it. And if you don't, maybe I won't go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 